Um, so welcome um, to tonight's session of Soil School. This is part of a month-long series with eight presentations, um, and this is the last week of it. So thank you for joining us. My name is Charlotte Trowbridge. I'm with the Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, we are one of the, the two hosts for this series. Um, and my co-host tonight is Randy. She will also be um, introducing her, the organization she works for, West Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, so the Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District, we work in Washington County, Oregon, um, and our mission is to create a sustainable and productive and healthy environment for the Washington County community. And we do that by working with residents of the county, um, providing educational opportunities, advice about natural resource conservation, and financial assistance for conservation projects. Um, and then our co-host, like I mentioned, our West Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District. So they're in our neighboring county. Randy, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks, Charlotte. Um, I'm Randy. I'm the office manager at West Multnomah. Uh, and our mission is to provide resources, information, and expertise to inspire people to actively improve air and water quality, fish and wildlife habitat, and soil health. We serve residents of Western Multnomah County, Sauvie Island, and a portion of the Bonnie Slope neighborhood with conservation planning, weed management, native plants, wildlife habitat restoration, and school and community gardens. Um, we are here today to talk about amending soil with biochar. As we discuss this important idea, it is important for our district to acknowledge the original stewards, the indigenous people of the land where we now provide conservation services and their deep and extensive knowledge of this land. We honor all tribes on the lands covered by the participants in this far reaching workshop and beyond by committing to work with their descendants and learn from their traditional ecological knowledge and relational worldview of the land and all things living upon it. We further recognize that we are here because of the land displacement, attempts at cultural erasure, and other sacrifices that were forced upon them. We also remind ourselves that we are guests of this land and must do our best to honor the original peoples through authentic cultural narratives and continued care of and giving to the air, water, plants, animals, soils, and the ecosystems that make up this land community. Great, thank you so much, Randy. Um, I just have a couple housekeeping items to go over before I introduce our speakers. Um, we are recording all of these sessions and they will be available for viewing on the Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District's YouTube channel. I'll put that link in the chat um, once we get going. Um, so if you, need, if you end up missing any chunk of tonight or want to revisit it, um, those recordings will be available uh, in a week or so. Um, we're going to have 10 minutes at the end for Q&A, potentially more. Um, and so there is a Q&A question and answer box where you can be jotting down your questions throughout the presentation. You'll also be able to see what other people are asking. And if there's a question that you really like or you have the same question, you're able to give a thumbs up and upvote it so that we prioritize those questions that are on a couple folks' minds. Um, if you're having any technical issues during the presentation, uh, it's best to use the chat box and we'll do, I'll do my best to, to help you out with whatever's happening. Um, and then finally, we've got a survey, a feedback survey that we'll send a link out for, um, and we hope you fill it out. It's really helpful in our planning for future um, workshops and soil school series. All right, so now I am very excited to pass things off to our presenters and dive into our topic tonight of biochar and soil amendments. Um, I'm going to introduce Guatemala Dia and, uh, and our secondary pr uh, presenter, Pete Gujral. Um, so Quatemoc is a regenerative farming educator teaching indigenous farming practices from his Taino, Aztec, and Mayan culture through the Savi Island Center located on Savi Island at Topaz Farm. The program reaches both youths and adults and brings them closer to sustainable farming and environmental conservation. He's implemented many of these indigenous practices around Topaz Farm, providing direct access for the public to learn more sustainable practices and eat nutrient-dense produce during the season. All right, so I'm going to pass things over to Quatimok and Pete. And thank you so much for being here tonight. Right, thanks for thanks for having me, and thanks uh, all of you guys for being here. It's an honor to be able to share with you a lot of this indigenous knowledge that has almost been lost. But you know, through organic farming, regenerative farming, and permaculture, it's making people kind of look back and 
into their own cultures to kind of find things that work. So the things I'm going to share with you today, as she mentioned, they come from the Taino people and they're indigenous to the Caribbean. They would have been the first people Columbus had met on his journey westward. And I'm, I'm descended from them on my mom's side. On my dad's side, I'm from the Aztec and Mayan people from, As from Mexico and, and South America, where all of these practices have been used. And it's so cool to kind of go back and look at what looks like ceremony and then realize, wait, this garden ceremony is actually a microculturing ceremony. And then be able to bring that into uh, modern times today to be helpful for food production. And so a lot of what we're doing now is that this is not no information that I've created, but it's gonna be information that was created a long time ago that now we're looking back on it and, and trying to resurrect. So um, thank you for being here. And uh, I'm Priya Gadral. So I originally come from the uh, Punjabi culture, the Sikh culture in Northwestern uh, India in the foothills of the Himalayas, which is one of the richest agricultural lands uh, in India, um, it's at the you know, collection of five rivers that just uh, you know flood every year and have very fertile land. So there's a, a lot of farming history and uh, a culture. You know, uh, I'm just sharing an image of the farm that I was working with last year, RBG Freedom Farm, part of the Black Food Sovereignty Coalition. Um, you know, on Wapato Island, what we refer to as Salvi Island now. And, uh, yeah, I'm really excited to share this uh, knowledge with you. You know, uh, a lot of it, you know, has been passed down uh, and then relearned, honestly, uh, over time, as I said, we all seek to form that stronger connection to uh, agricultural backgrounds and, you know, food sovereignty. So I wanted to share uh, a land acknowledgement. You know, I mentioned the land that we farm on, Wapto Island, uh, also referred to as Salvi Island, which has been historically stewarded by the Multnomah people of the Chinook Indians. Uh, and the Multnomah people uh, were spread out over this area, but uh, Wapto Island was an especially, um, you know, major, uh, area for gathering because of its, you know, placement, you know, at the mouth of two rivers. Uh, it was a very, it was a place that many uh, other uh, nations had to pass through and it was a gathering place. You know, there were 15 Multnomah villages on the island with many cedar log houses to host visiting nations for the annual Wapato harvest. You know, Wapato is the uh, arrowhead leafed wild potato that you see in that picture, which was a major food source as was camas. Um, they would go out into lakes and ponds with their canoes and harvest the bulbs by digging into the mud with their feet. And Wapato was roasted, eaten, dried, stored, traded to other nations. Uh, the Multnomah were really decimated by disease outbreaks in the 1830s and those who remained were very violently wiped out by the settlers you know, uh, in that area. So there's a, a lot of uh, history that is lost that uh, I've been working to piece together. And I wanna also just send a shout out to Lucas Angus, who I uh, farmed with uh, from uh, Seven Waters Canoe family, who helped share some of these stories with me so that, uh, you know, they can be passed on so that we know, you know, the history of the, um, the peoples who we, uh, are so grateful for the land that we uh, have farmed on. Yeah. All right, so we'll jump into um, our first indigenous technology lesson. And it, if you, it really is the fire. It really, like, if you think of the fire, it probably was like the first classroom. It's where people would have gathered and cooked their food. So from the beginning of the time, fires had a special role. In, in humans and, and their development with each other and the land. So first thing we're gonna talk about today is what's called biochar. And this is what we call taking the biomass and putting it under heat so that we're able to extract the volatile uh, gases from the biomass leaving just behind its, its carbon structure. And I like to think of the carbon structure as like its skeleton, its bones. Uh, each different uh, material is gonna, gonna have a different benefit for creating biochar, 
But the first thing you got to know when you select your biochar, and we want to encourage you, this is what you're doing with like your burn piles. You know, this is this is the way we're traditionally we're making burn piles and we're burning. But you know, I think if we can look at burning a little bit differently, we can maybe think about maybe capturing that as biochar and then using that in different uh, restoration projects and garden uh, and agriculture. So what I found in California, where I'm from, um, you can make fires no matter what. It's so dry all the time. But for you guys up here, all the rain makes the biomass sometimes difficult to burn. We've had workshops where the fire never kicked off. So what we're doing here, you'll see that they're holding up what's called a moisture meter. They're sold for about $40. And if you zap your wood with that moisture meter, it's going to tell you exactly how much water's in that biomass. And what you're kind of looking for is about a 15% moisture content in that biomass. You can go up to about a 20, but um, it, it, in between 15 and 20, but anything higher than that, you can potentially not get that fire to combust. And the, the benefits of doing these kinds of fires is you want that wood dry because if it's wet, it's gonna smoke. And that's the opposite of doing conservation uh, burn that we're gonna learn a little bit later. So get yourself a moisture meter or make sure that your wood is seasoned and dried. Very good. Then once you have collected your feedstock, um, you're gonna stack it just like you would any, any burn pile. Um, considering though the sizes of the logs, if you had really big, giant, thick diameter logs, you'd kind of want to sandwich that down the bottom. You want kind of looser material, and then you put those big diameter logs on top of that. And then you can see in slide two how um, Sochi had lined those things up vertical. If you line your wood up vertical like that, it releases the gases much quicker and gets it. Um, raises the heat up to a level that makes conservation burn uh, to, to convert it into biochar. So when we're making these wood piles, you're thinking about how can I drive the heat high? Because what you need to do is get that heat so high the gases come out of the wood or the biomass, leaving you just behind that carbon structure or, or the skeleton. So um, a lot of different materials you can use from around the farm to create your, your biochar. You know, mostly we're using the tree droppings, but down at Topaz Farm, we started collecting all the uh, all the trimmings from like the island from everybody in the neighborhood. They were able to come drop it off and convert it into into biochar. We even got like my favorite to convert is the picture one, the, the cannabis stocks. We're finding out like cannabis stocks. It's just not fun to burn, but it also has like 200 percent more semiconductor capacity, which means electrical charge for the soil. So that plant just has amazing regenerative capacity and nobody uses it when they're done harvesting. All the hemp fields, all the, the cannabis fields, they just throw that stuff out. So when I'm doing this project and I'm thinking with my indigenous mind, I'm looking for materials that's, that's got that extra charge and that's being thrown away locally that I can bring back in, in, in the conversion. So um, feedstock, you can use any kind of feedstock. Um, and it's all going to create a different type of electrical charge for the soil. If you think of the forest fires, when they burn through all of the plants that grow there, their limbs fall, but they burn and they re recarbonize themselves back to the soil. And those are specifically for that piece of land. So all that information is directly stored in that local carbon. I kind of feel the same way when we grow plants on our land and when we process things from the land is it has a certain type of um, information, ecological information that once it's maintained in that carbon structure, it could potentially accelerate the regeneration process. So once I've stacked up that wood, I'm gonna wanna, um, traditionally we're lighting that fire down at the bottom when we make our burn piles. Uh, but if you light that fire up at the top, you'll see there in the fourth picture, you are gonna get a whole different kind of uh, fire coming off of the, uh, of the burn. Now, Go ahead and slide that next one. The type of burn in which we light from the top, if you were to just to look it up and learn more about it, they do call it the conservation burn. But what's super cool is that lighting that fire at the top, when you start to get smoke down below that first burn at the top, the smoke is actually combustible and it's fuel. And we don't realize that when we're making fires. But when you get the smoke to come back into that top lit fire, it's gonna drive the heat and the combustion much higher. 
And that's the key to making good char. You've got to get the heat to accelerate very, very high, very hot, very fast. So the stacking of the wood to get the, get the wood to release its volatile gases, which then is gonna control that, the, the, the temperature. Lagging neck at the top is exactly what you wanna do to get this thing going and to get the complete combustion. So I kind of like to picture the fire being at the top. If that big pile was like a sponge, the fire is gonna be the pressure that squeezes out all of the volatile gases so the more squeezing or the more heat you have on that biomass pile, the more pure of the carbon you're going to get left behind. Um, conservation burns are your traditional burn piles you see down in the bottom left side. But there's also a lot of kiln technology, which allows for less oxygen to hit the pile, which translates into more carbon being captured. And these, these um, the kilns are, be, are being used in forestry management currently because they can produce a large amount of char specifically from those sites that then can accelerate the regeneration process. But you don't always got to do the burn pile. You see in the middle there, we're using just a little fire pit um, uh, 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 stove. And, but we did the same process. We stacked the wood the way we wanted. We lit at the top. And these fires are virtually smokeless because of the of the flame being at the top. Every time the smoke tries to escape and go up into the atmosphere, it's going to be caught in combustion. So currently in California, we're implementing the days where they have no burn days. They're currently studying to see the reduction in the particulates coming off of the conservation burns to potentially let the farmers continue to convert on the no burn days if they can use this practice and they also know that the char going back to the ground is also going to be beneficial for uh, agencies as well. <clears throat> the, um, go ahead. the amount of time that we're going to cook that char down, um, it depends on the size of the pile and the kind of uh, feed stock that you have. But this is why doing maybe smaller piles in the beginning to kind of get that art down so you can know exactly when to, to get the fire and extinguish the fire. Um, we're, we're waiting for, traditionally, we'll let that fire burn down into a lot of the biomass is covered just with ash. When we start to see the ash, that tells us that the carbon now is starting to oxidize and we're losing it and it's now becoming, uh, becoming ash. But there's a certain level of ash in which you're gonna allow, depending on the diameter of the wood, to make sure that the inside of that biomass has then been, um, uh, converted into uh, good carbon conversion. So the smaller piles allow you to kind of practice this art a little bit before we jump into like these big piles that we did at Cake Bread Cellar down in Napa, California, um, where we would, we would do this kind of management. They would use, I think they would spend about $20,000 to rotate the blocks of vineyards when they were done producing and haul them off to the dumps. When they learned about doing conservation burn and getting the carbon back into the soil, I think it only cost them about $5,000 in labor. They saved a lot of money, but then the grapes, the, the quality of the grapes uh, increase because of the higher carbon in the soil. So whether you're doing big piles or you're doing small piles, um, there's a lot of technologies out there to help you along. Kelpie Wilson's Ring of Fire Kiln here. We do a lot of demos with that on a Topaz farm. And we just rerun this thing all the time. This is how we make most of our char. It allows you to just keep feeding and keep feeding. Um, there's a veterans group up in Washington, the Rake Force. They added two of these together, and they just convert so much biomass from, the, from their local forest. So, um, which actually they do get carbon credits, too, for the conversions that they're doing. So actually getting paid to convert and make biochar now is... Um, Real exciting to hear uh, the industry moving forward and the appreciation for capturing carbon with this type of technology. Because now when you capture the carbon in this way, it could be thousands of years locked into the soil as biochar, as carbon, and not being um, decomposed and sent up in the atmosphere as CO2. So we're really locking in this, the, 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 the carbon in, in, in the biochar form and doing our part to, to lower the CO2 levels. You know, we get that fire rolling nice and hot. Let's just keep adding to that. We make probably about a yard and a half out of this particular kiln, running at about um, 
five or six hours. Now, when we're quenching the fire, you got to think about like nature and nature when the forest would burn, you know, sometimes the, for, the fireman puts it out, but a lot of times it just goes out and it goes out with the rains or the mudslides, smother it out. But this is like the most important part because when that carbon is heated and when it's in flux, it's like a blank tape recorder waiting to record its environment. And the first thing that cools it gets locked into the carbon structure of the char and changes its electrical potential higher or lower. But the point is, this is where it gives you the chance as a char producer to program your char. You can cool your char down with water because you don't want it all to go to ash and that's fine, you'll have great char. But if you wanted to at this point, add in different kinds of compost teas, um, different kinds of um, microbial inoculants. Or what I like to do is take the blocks from the best vineyards and then make a tea from that and add them directly to the char right away to give me a greater chance of maybe producing the microbial biology that's already proven to do so good in those blocks, getting them to live in that, in that carbon structure of the char. So cooling it is very important. If you were to look at that char under a microscope, once you're done with it, it's gonna look like a beehive. There's like honeycomb structures in that char. You have um, places for water, nutrients, uh, fungi, bacteria, nematodes all love to live inside of that char. It, it's, a, it's a permanent house for a long time. When it gets too hot, they can go back into the char. When the water comes, they can go in and out. Acts like a coral reef. So I just like to imagine like what little guys I'm putting into the coral reef now at this point and how they're gonna continue to, to grow in my, in my, in my fields. Um, some of the ways we can get that tea in is that the hose end sprayers, those work really well um, for cooling the char. I like the injector in the middle because that goes right in line and you can run the big hose and really blast that thing with good dial adjustments. Or if you're doing those small little backyard barbecue pits, there's no reason why we don't put it in the little canisters there to um, add those life-giving microbes right into the char immediately. And yes, some do die. They get heated and they die right away. But what you gotta understand is like their information is all what's cooling the char and the char locks in that information and raises what we call the far infrared, which is basically means it makes the cells divide raises that far infrared potential even greater, depending on what microbes you enlist for that cooling process. Um, yeah, so a lot of the indigenous ways we use to collect microbes is simple rice washing. Every time you're cooking rice and you wash that rice out, you don't realize, and we throw that water out, but that water actually has tons of beneficial microbes, particularly labs that they're referred to lactic acid bacteria but amazing um, processors of organic matter and most importantly, keeping things clean. So I like to save all of my rice wash water. And then that's what I begin to use to culture. I mean, it's Russian roulette. You don't know what you have, but you figure if I buy good organic rice, yeah, maybe a brown rice where it even has more shell. That rice has been submerged in water with lots of microbes already around it. They get up into the rice and dormant. So that's the benefit of the rice wash is I get to kind of pull them off of there. And most of the time, they're better than what you already have because you have none already. So the, the rice wash is a great way to get them. I'll take that rice wash water and then I'll mix that rice wash water. Um, or you can use compost tea water, it doesn't matter. But if you're going to use one part of the, of the water or the tea to one part molasses and 20 parts water, and I'll take that into a fermentation and I'll close that down. Um, yeah, so we wanna make sure that that water is clean water. If you're using um, tap water that has chlorine, you're gonna, you know, obviously it's made to kill microbes. So you can kill some of the beneficial microbes you're trying to culture. So make sure that that water gases off prior to using, keep it in mind that you're, you're growing something alive and you wanna do it with good conditions. Mm -hmm. I like to add that tea once I have it into big into containers for uh, fertilizing plants. I go about half cup per gallon and I spin that thing with the air. This has only been about 30 minutes on the spinner and it just gets so much oxygen uh, coming from the little microbes. So this tells me, yeah, we got them. You know, I know something's in there. I don't know what they are, but I know they're in there and the plants seem happy. 
Um, so um, that's a good way to use your tea water, whether you're doing it large scale or small scale. Um, we have also a lot of injectors that we can drop in that same brew water. And we've got the dosatron that you can dial and set in to irrigate your fields. Um, the center pitchers, uh, really cool at Topaz Farm. That's the big irrigation pump that does everything. We wanted to, to get the microbes into the field. So um, Peter Topaz actually tapped in a line to the main irrigation pump that then siphons out my compost teas into the irrigation lines. So every time the big cannons are running, I'm, I'm dumping in liquids into, into the field, uh, regenerating the soil for, for agriculture. So there's a lot of cool ways you can do it, whether big or small. Uh, the benefits though are, you know, you get to, you get to clean the water. This is actually the picture, the center picture, the, the allergy that, the algae that went, used to clog the whole waterway there. Like we never even saw the bottom of that platform until we actually started putting EM into the water, the probiotic teas and cleaning that up. And then it started to compete for nitrogen with the algae that little by little, that whole area got cleaned up. So we don't only use it into the field, it's since we irrigate with that water, we're trying to also improve the health of that Gilbert Canal um, because that is our, you know, our lifeblood pretty much with these beneficial probiotics. And um, here we have biochar and compost teas being used in the city of Portland. Some of the stormwater facilities um, have been set up to, so because biochar, you know, we had a lot of plant loss in so many stormwater facilities and biochar having the capacity to keep things alive and not only filter water, they're in a lot of trials now testing out the uh, moisture contents of the, of the facilities. So we're starting to see a lot of the indigenous practices we've done a long time coming together with local agencies. Now, another cool way we can capture microorganisms is we take, um, we take some kind of micro bait. And in this case, this one I think is gonna be uh, a wheat bran but you can take rice, you can take wheat, you can take oats, you can take wood chips. And we mix that with a little bit of biochar. And we, you can either wrap that offering up into a sack or you can put it into a basket. But the point is that little thing there is gonna, that little bait there is gonna be food for the microbes that you're trying to catch. Now, why do you wanna catch microbes? Because all through the environment we have depending where you're at, if you're you know, in the forest, you're gonna have beneficial fungi that are proven to do the work. I mean, when we collect these things, there's an indigenous ceremonies in which how we do it, but when you look at that forest and how it's operating, you wanna pick areas to bury the microbates that you can tell life is just jamming. You know, the river's flowing, the birds are singing, the insects are there, there's fish in the water. When you look at that big mic macro picture, and you think about, well, then that means the micro picture must be intact. This is where indigenous people would have ceremonies where they would take different offerings and, and bury them into the land. And each land's gonna offer something different. You know, if you're out there in the prairie, you may get a lot of good beneficial bacteria that you just can't buy in the store. And they've been proving their work forever. You know, just look around where you're collecting. You'll see the grasses are healthy. You'll see the relations they have with the birds. And when we're collecting microbes and bringing them back, you wanna make sure they've done the proven work before seeing them in their office, in other words, you know, for sure that, that they're doing good. So we'll take those offerings and we'll bury them into the ground, um, whether we're using a basket or I'm wrapping it up into a sack. Um, I mean, that is really, some guys even use old cotton sacks, but you put it in there, you bury it up and you go about 12 inches down into the ground and you wait about nine or 13 days and leave a mark so you know where it's at. Sometimes you forget. But you'll, by the time that offering is in the ground, you're gonna have healthy microorganisms trying to get to it because it's food. And as they're munching on it, you'll begin to see the sack's gonna change. But they're coming into, they're coming into the sack, they're coming into the char, and they're not only eating it, but they're calling it home. So after about nine or 13 days, we can uh, pull that sack out and it should be loaded down 
beneficial fungi and bacteria, usually giving you a beautiful um, signal with the white fuzz on there. It tells you, tell you it's good because, you know, think about the forest when you go into the look, lift up that leaf litter and you begin to see the fuzz happening and your mushrooms nearby. This is what threads all the goodness. So now you like have all the, all the microbe goodness right there in your hand, depending on where you buried it, whether you're trying to capture the good microbes from your healthy berries or you're trying to get them from the forest. This is the, this is the result of it. You end up with some beautiful living biology. Um, you can even um, bury your sacks in your favorite compost pile or maybe your buddy's compost pile whose garden is doing way better than yours. And then those little microbes would then find that little sack that you buried with your oats and biochar and begin to colonize in there. And then you're going to bring those things back. Um, and once you have those, those microbes, you can, you can culture the collection. And culturing the collection um, can consist of, of different things. But what you're going to use is you'll take that, that collection and you'll squeeze that collection into some water and in, into about half a gallon of water. And then you'll use about four ounces of that water, four ounces of molasses to about five gallons of, of good clean water. And you can mix all that together with about 50 pounds of rice or wheat bran. Uh, over at Topaz, we use coffee shaft. But you can mix it with any kind of organic matter and hopefully begin to culture the microbes that you harvested from, from the site. Um, if you add biochar to the culturing in the collection, you'll obviously produce um, healthier microbes. Um, so, so yeah, it's a little bit about the culturing. Next one. It's great to do it in groups. You can do this thing in community. People are having a good time when you're mixing together. Uh, it's just so much information starts to flow when you start working with these little microbes. Um, but it, I mean, it, it could be backbreaking work for, you know, we're all down on the ground, but we're having a good time for sure. If you need to scale up, we got the mixer going. Uh, we, can, we can run that mixer and make, you know, three times the amount in the same amount of time. I love the hand mix stuff myself, but we, we don't have time for that always. Doing it with the mixer, you can, you can scale up and and um, make quite a bit of, uh, of the organic matter ready for your garden. Once you've, collect, once you've mixed it all together, you can take it through a fermentation and we use either, you can use garbage bags, pack it in there and tie it up. You may need to use two because there's gonna be a lot of gases being produced from the microorganisms. It's actually a great lesson to learn because then you can see the expansion of the bag and then after a certain amount of days, it begins to implode itself by sucking in the gases. And uh, you can kind of figure out like the duration of its life um, based on the fermentation and the gassing and the implosion of the gases. You can kind of get a good feel of how long it takes to ferment, but you can also use, you know, plastic buckets. You can use the pickling barrels if you're making a lot of the, uh, of the, of the mix. So there's a lot of ways you can scale up and make this thing big or, or keep it small for your home garden. Once you've made the mix, I encourage you that you dry the mix. And drying the mix just basically means after letting it ferment for um, seven to 13 days, we lay it out onto a tarp and then we, let, we can, we can uh, let that thing dry and it can last for years once it's dry. You're gonna have to rotate that mix um, every, probably every couple hours, depending if it's a sunny day or if it, you know, you can't dry in the rain in Oregon, so you got to make sure you have the right time to dry. But drying that allows you to store for a long time, but you don't have to always, if you want to use it fresh, you're more than happy to use it, you know, you can use it fresh, but just make sure you use it all right away and you don't let it um, sit in, the, in, a, in a bucket. The more airspace that you have in the bucket, once the fermentation's gone, the more potential for spoiling that you'll have. So if you need to use it wet, use it all right away. A lot of the ways I like to use it is in this um, composting system called the Bocacci bucket. And the Bocacci bucket has a little spigot down at the bottom there. And that little spigot actually allows you to collect a really good quality tea. When I throw in organic matter, fruits and vegetables, I add a little bit of that fermentation mix that I made. 
And then that fermentation mix begins to ferment the organic matter that I put in the bucket. So whether it's carrots or, you know, apples, they begin to get fermented by that organic uh, mix that we made. And this actually allows me to use the full nutrition of my compost because it's being bioavailably positioned by fermentation in the bucket with the lid on. No gases are coming off, which means no nutrients are coming off of my compost. So you can have some really nutrient-rich compost by going fermentation route instead of the traditional compost route that we go. So I'll ferment up my organic matter, my, my whatever I've been eating for two weeks in this bucket. And during those two weeks, I'm collecting the tea down at the bottom. And then once the organic matter in the bucket has fermented, I go out in the garden and I can dig a trench and add the contents of the bucket in that trench, cover it all up, wait about two more weeks now, and then you can plant directly on top. And everything you had in that bucket now is nutritionally and bioavailable for that plant. You're going to stick right on top there. So a lot of times you, you need absolutely nothing once you've added in the fermented food waste into the system. We also take the bran and we can um, top dress our plants. And we go about three quarter uh, cut per square meter on that. You can go once a week for heavy feeding plants like the like tomatoes and, and, and things like that. Or if, you know, if you're doing lettuce, maybe every two weeks, three weeks, you, you'll be able to top dress. But we'll increase the nutrient density of your crops. Now, if you didn't want to go through any of those steps, <laughs> this is how I originally learned how to work with microbes. And it's, it's Dr. Higa there. <clears throat> and he has a product called Effective Microbes. Dr. Higa is a scientist from Japan who worked for the chemical companies. And they hired him to find the super microbe that can, that can uh, so they can patent and sell, right? And, and, and keep making money. Well, Dr. Higa would keep, go to all the healthy farms in Japan, look at different microbes, isolate them and study them. And every time he would end up with a dead end with these microbes, they would just fail. And he would take his finished project and he was so frustrated one day with this project, he kept failing, kept failing. He would take all his projects and toss them out the back door on his way home. The day he was gonna quit his job, he went out the same back door he always does with his head down in failure because he couldn't figure out what microbe it was that was the magic microbe. And he had his head down and looked down at the ground. And he saw the patch of grass was greener than the whole place around, all the other grass around him. So it hit him. It's that's where I've been dumping my, studying my microbes and dumping them. So, but the problem was he was studying them in isolation. So he went back into the lab, put them all together. And he was the first guy to put microbes all together that normally a scientist would never mix. Anaerobic microbes, aerobic microbes. Nobody would ever put them together. He put them together. And because he saw the patch of grass and they did what they needed to do in the lab and he came come out with this EM brew. Um, what's really cool about it though, the story gets better, when he got the EM brew, he did what I think um, the direction a lot of things are going now, but he took it to the indigenous farmers of Japan and they would practice a lot of natural farming and they did a lot of the steps I showed you in the beginning. Um, and when Dr. Higa explained to the natural farmers what he had and, and how it came about, they were excited to try the mix. So he incubated the EM inside the natural farming community of the indigenous farmers of Japan who ran it, who test ran this product for him. And with great success and gave him the stamp of approval, it showed all the signs of balance in, in the environment. It showed all the signs of balance that they needed for the people. And this thing went worldwide. And it's, um, I believe that it's those kinds of partnerships where we take science and we invite the indigenous community together to advance and authorize and authenticate those kinds of advances. We really do make the world a better place. And EM is now all over the world. Um, it's a type of brew where once you have it, you can, you can culture it and share it with other people. You can, it takes on all of the signs that tell you that this comes from a natural, the natural way, like the way the earth evolved. It's like earth medicine. So there's a lot of ways to develop your relationship with the earth. And in particularly those little guys, we don't see the microbes, which are really directly related to you because you have, you know, 10 times more bacteria, fungi on your body than you do blood cells. 
you can begin to see the connection between living soil and living people that we can, um, we can close the gap in our differences by relating closely to soil. And I, I wanna thank you guys for being here today. If you have any questions, I would like to try to answer them. Great, thank you so much, Fatimog. And yes, there are questions. Um, and so I will start working through them. Um, but for folks who maybe need to, to hop off, um, I'm gonna put the feedback form link uh, in the chat and you can, um, you can follow up with that. But thank you so much for that presentation. A couple, um, just a comment that somebody shared that I'd love to have the group here. Um, somebody mentioned that they love their Bokashi compost bucket. It never stinks and that they run the liquid down the drain of their cabin to keep the septic happy. So that's that's a fun comment. Um, then a couple of quick clarifying things before we go into some deeper questions. Um, can you repeat the correct moisture content for the conservation burn feedstock? Yeah, you're gonna look for 15 or 20% moisture content in that feedstock. Great, thank you. And then another clarifying question. Um, somebody was just wanting to make sure when uh, when you're talking about burying the offering, you're talking about burying that micro bait, right? Correct, that's usually okay. in a sack or as I said, my buddy uses a cotton sock, so you could use a scarf, but yeah, something that Perfect. encloses that offering, yeah. Great, thank you. All right, um, so bouncing around to some other questions. Um, does Wapato grow now on Wapato Island? Mm -hmm. It does. There's a lot of places where it grows. And it's so cool. I'm doing this project. I actually met a family who has kept their land in conservation since their family has taken it from First People. The, their family was close to the First People, and it was important for them to keep it in conservation. So they have like canals that go to full ponds of Wapato. Like it's like a history going back in time. But it is also scattered throughout other areas around the island. If you visit the wildlife areas, you'll see it in, in, the, in the watershed areas. And um, yep, it grows there. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's, a, I think, Seven Waters Canoe Family just uh, had a project to replant camas in the uh, pond by Howell Territorial Park uh, on Owapto Island as well to help uh, get the camas populations up. Great, thank you. Um, a question about different kiln types. So do you have an organ kiln, a ring of fire? Um, can you compare those? Or? Okay, um, great kilns made by the same person. I like the um, ring of fire for doing big, large biomass con uh, conversions right there on site. But like for forestry stuff, the organ kiln, the, you know, we can carry that up into the woods and it's just a lot smaller and easier to handle and you can get those things rolling, rolling nicely too. You can't put as much biomass into them, but you can take them into more remote places and easier to handle. So they're both very nice. It depends on what you're doing and how much char you're making. But I love them both. Thank you. Um, we have somebody who's not sure that they understand what is meant by microbes in the block. Can you explain that a bit more? Say again? Um, microbes in the block. Maybe maybe that was something we misheard. When you were talking about uh, making a tea uh, from the um, the grape blocks. Oh yeah, okay. So block is in reference to a section of uh, of, of of production the grapes um, are designated under. So each block will may have different varieties uh, on them, but it's how we distinguish what block, what section of the vineyard we're working on. So when I referred to the block, you always have these super high performing areas in, in the vineyard or even in your ag field where just the plants always do well. So when I put my micro bait, I wanna put it into those areas or as I said in the, in the presentation or in those blocks that have, that, that show me more characteristics of a healthy ecology happen below ground. And then hopefully I can transport that over to the lower performing areas and they can pick up those characteristics. So that's what the block was in reference to was the area of production. Thank you. Do you create biochar in place or burn in one spot and spread it? Oh um, no, we burn in one spot and then smash and spread. We were able to now put it into the cedars. So when we're seeding, we can drop in the char too. So um, we, uh, we, we take it out and apply. Mm -hmm. To one step, uh, 
after you uh, quench it, uh, what we did at one of our piles is everybody ran onto the pile and stomped on, on it. So it turns into a fine dust to make it easier to spread. Great, thank you. Um, for the Bokashi buckets, does it matter if you use plastic, wood, glass, or metal containers? Well, most of them have been plastic. Yeah, they're, they do fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you know, glass is always best for fermentation, but you're gonna have, it's, you gotta be careful with glass, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great, and it looks like we've got one more question in the chat here, and then maybe time for me to ask a question on my mind. Um, so can we just use small tree limbs and larger chunks of fir, oak, et cetera, in our outdoor fireplace to make biochar for a small city farm? Yes, yes, just stack accordingly. Make sure you give those big logs a chance to cook and the smaller limbs accelerate that, the combustion heat. So you, you'll play with the, the pile a bit, but just make sure you, you get that heat and cook time down. Mm -hmm. but absolutely. Great, thank you. So the, all the submitted questions, I'm gonna ask one more and if anybody else has, has last uh, thoughts, you can pop them in the chat right now and we'll touch, touch on those. Um, but I'm curious whether there's any kind of seasonality to when you're um, adding amendments to the soil. So are you, do you find that um, introducing the biochar, the inoculants um, is really helpful like before the growing season to get things really moving or adding it to help the soil uh, kind of stay intact and strong over the winter? Do you have any season, seasonal considerations to, to when amendments are made? Hmm. Always best at the start. Uh, winter's cool because a lot of water in, in the soil doesn't sleep, so it's, it's nice that way. But I've also added it in, in the middle of the growing season when plants were kind of, they were getting overwatered or maybe the nutrient regimen was off, the pH started to do something different. Doing a top dress late season on, on your plants and watering from the top allows for the little micro dust to kind of get down into the cracks. And you know, by that time late in the season, the soils do start to compact and the plants get bigger, so their exodites and sugars you know, start to increase. So that's gonna change the pH a little bit. So adding it in mid-season, you'll find your plants get a super good lift and flower sets are really nice. And the blooms actually last a little bit longer than if you're doing flowers because of that, that added charge. Yeah, one note I would add is just like, you should know what purpose you have for adding an amendment, you know, and the ag world, we test our soil at the beginning of the season, we test our soil at the end of the season to understand the uh, nutrition content. You know, in the off season, we're typically cover cropping to try and uh, get some organic matter and, you know, nitrogen and, you know, elements back into the soil. You know, one of the nice side effects of biochar is that it will correct pH, uh, similar to, you know, uh, agricultural lime. Um, but it takes some time. So if you are trying to correct the pH, you may want to add it, you know, well before you uh, start planting, uh, if that's your goal. But again, you know, anytime you add it, it's going to have some benefit. It's just a matter of which, uh, what you're looking for. Yeah, that's a good point. And we found that like adding biochar in rows is a big expenditure, but we've also did side-by-sides where they just added it in in the holes where they were planting. And growth rates and everything kind of, they were all the same. You really couldn't tell the difference until you took it into the lab and you, take, you sent it in for what's called a terpene test, how much odor is in that strawberry or cherry where you can tell the difference. But as far as like weight and structure and everything, you can save a lot of money by just putting it into the holes unless you're exclusively growing something for, for odor quality, then you, you know, you'll put it all the way through, but yeah. Great, thank you. And we've got one more question that came in. Um, are there classes to attend at Topaz Farm? 100%, go to Topaz website. We've got all kinds of stuff going on all the time. We've had Bokashi, compost teas. We run the kiln for everybody. So uh, yeah. And I think thank also you. the uh, Salvi Island Center website. Right, Salvi Island Center is a component to Topaz Farm. You'll, you'll see it in there, but we're on the same land and they host education as well. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you so much.
Well, that's a great note to end on because I'm always happy to see people wanting to learn more. Um, so Kwatimok and Preet, thank you so much for your time tonight. This was a great presentation. Um, and thank you to everyone who attended tonight and asked questions and tuned in. Um, and we've got one more Soil School session this Thursday. So one more chance to, to catch a presentation. Um, but aside from that, you can always be checking back in with, um, with your conservation district, both Tualatin and West Multnomah. Um, we try to offer workshops on a variety of topics all throughout the year. And we're also happy to connect you with uh, our conservation specialists to talk through um, natural resource questions and issues. So, so yeah, I encourage you all to follow up with Topaz Farm and Savi Island Center and the, the conservation districts. So thank you everyone and have a great night. Kwatimoka Preet, any, any last words or? Yeah, I just actually saw the note of uh, running the liquid down the drain uh, to keep the septic happy. Uh, which remind me, there's a, another great use for bakashi and, uh, well, you know, biochar, which is, uh, you know, uh, chickens, any livestock that you may have, uh, you'll find that if you accidentally, like, spill some biochar, they will eat it immediately. You know, chickens uh, have that need for grit, you know, pigs do as well, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, livestock... <laughs> I, I accidentally dumped my uh, worm bucket in the yard and uh, our dog just was all over it. Had to literally keep him away from it because they, uh, they know a good thing, you know, and uh, that can totally help guts as well. And so livestock is another way or, you know, running it down the drain to keep the septic happy. The, your septic is a living environment, uh, just like your soil. Just Thank you for having us. Great, thank you so much. Everybody take care and we'll see you at a future presentation. Thanks.